Hello class and welcome to Lecture Notes on the Market Revolution. Before we get started, it's one thing to note here, the Market Revolution is a period from 1815 to 1846. Uh, it occurs during other periods of American history. Uh, one such era is called the Era of Good Feelings. It's a period of national pride following the War of 1812. Uh, it's a period where there weren't a lot of political competitions going on. The Federalist Party has declined, and basically it's just the Democratic Republicans who are in charge. There's not much opposition. And it also includes the period of Jacksonian America with President Jackson. And so it covers a wide range of information and time periods. Uh, but what we're looking at here in the market revolution is a change in industry, a change in transportation, technology, and communication. Okay, so the key event that we're going to be dealing with in this period is the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution begins in England in the 1700s, uh, and eventually it's going to make its way around the world and to the United States as well. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is a period when powered machines were taking the place of hand-operated tools. So instead of things being handmade, they're able to be made in a factory. Manufacturing becomes more rapid and extensive, and this really takes place because of the steam-powered engine. There were a number of steam-powered engines that were developed during the 1700s, but the steam-powered engine patented in 1769 by James Watt is the one that really helped lead to this explosion in factories and industrialization. The first areas that took root with factories and industrialization was in the textile industry, which is making cotton into thread and cloth. The textile industry quickly became one of the most profitable industries in England and then the world, and it is going to in turn lead to higher demand for raw materials such as cotton, which will have an effect on the United States South, which is an area that produces much of the cotton in the 1800s. Related to the issue of the Industrial Revolution is urbanization. During this period when factories are being built, many people are going to move from rural areas into urban areas because they're going to be looking for work in factories. Uh, many experience some improvement economically. So as they leave the farms, they're able to get more uh, things, more money, more products. Uh, they are able to buy more. However, it's going to cost a lot. It's going to change their way of life. So there's going to be rigid routines routines, rigid schedules. It's going to become very impersonal relationships with your employer and your employee, whereas before you may know personally the person you work for. When you're working in a factory, it's much more anonymous. It's also going to change centuries of social standards. Uh, traditions of how people live and go about their daily lives, patterns of cultural and religious practices. All of this is going to change as people leave the world that they know and move into these urbanized areas, working in factories and doing things differently than they've been done for the past hundreds of years. And so this is just to give you a background of industrialization, uh, which started in the 1700s in England. It takes a lot longer for industrialization to take root in the United States. Part of that might be because when Thomas Jefferson takes office, if you remember, Thomas Jefferson's idea of the future of America is a future with subsistence farming and, you know, you own your farm, you have a plantation maybe, but it wasn't a idea that the United States should be a big country with huge factories and big cities and things like that. So it's going to take a while, but eventually industrialization does come to the United States and it's going to be a shift away from those subsistence farm situations. People aren't going to be just living to make food that they can eat. They're going to be moving into markets. They're going to be working in factories. Just like in England, it's going to be textile Mills that are really the start of this, uh, especially in the Northeast, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. They're going to be buying things instead of making them themselves. Uh, work is going to become specialized, so you have a very specific job that you do and you become an expert at it. And cities are going to grow with factories and people coming to work in those factories. And so this is going to lead to urbanization in the United States. For industrialization to be possible, it's going to take a few things. And the most important thing is efficient transportation systems. In order for industrialization to take place, you have to have a way for people to get materials from where they are produced, such as cotton or lumber or whatever the raw material is, to a market where it can be used. And then you also need a way for the market to 
bring those products that they're producing and get them to you, the purchaser. So the best way to do that is you need transportation. You need a way to get those things uh, to and fro. Uh, the other thing that you're going to need is cheap or in the case of slavery, free labor uh, for this to work out really well. You need mass markets. So you need places where lots of people are. Industrialization will not work if people are spread out all over the place. And you also need some advancements in technology and communication. And so when we talk about the market revolution, it's really four different revolutions that we're talking about. The industrial revolution, the communication revolution, the transportation revolution, and the technological revolution that takes place during this period. Some other things that are needed for the industrial revolution is entrepreneurs, people who are willing to invest their money or capital into a new industry. You have to have people who are willing to do that, otherwise these companies aren't going to form. You need investors who are protected by patents uh, so that they can make money off of their hard work. And then you also need a system where people are free to do the things that they think will make them the money um, without being told by the government to do that. That's the American system of capitalism and free enterprise. This helps the corporations grow. And during this period, they have a lot of free reign to do what they need to do in order for these industries to expand and grow. One example of this that we can look at is the Lowell Mills. Uh, the Lowell Mills are a place where they produced textiles. Uh, they started by Francis Cabot Lowell. He built a company that was going to create cloth. And so the thing that he did here was he hired young girls to work in his factory. The idea here is that they... Uh, can come from the farms instead of working on the farms. Uh, they don't have families to support or anything like that. They can come, they can live on site in dorms, just like uh, colleges today, for example, and then they can work. Uh, the problem is that a lot of these mills have very, very poor conditions. The, the wages were very low because the idea was that the people working there, this isn't they don't need this to survive. They have a place to live. They don't have a family to support, so they don't need to pay them as much. Uh, but the work conditions were also very dangerous. These are brand new mills. They don't have safety guides like we do today that keep you from getting caught into the machinery. Uh, it was just open, and so people could be. It could be a dangerous place to be. Uh, the other issue is that workers were easily replaced. And so, like I said before, this was a situation where people didn't have that personal connection with their employer that they may have if they're working on a farm or working for their neighbor. But during this period, mills started popping up, especially in the Northeast. Uh, cities like Lowell were a big point where lots of things were taking place. Smithfield, Cumberland, Falls River, Warwick, uh, Dover. And so, Mills in the Northeast were a very booming industry during this period. The key for these mills to work, though, was technology. There needed to be new technology. And in this case, the technology that helped make these mills possible was the cotton gin. So the cotton gin was a device that helped process raw cotton. When you pick cotton, they have these little seeds inside of them that have to be picked out by hand. And this is a perfect example of the Industrial Revolution where a machine was taking a job that used to be done by hand. So the cotton gin would work where you put the raw cotton in, you would crank the handle, and it would process the cotton through removing those little seeds. And of course, as they started using steam engines, these devices could get bigger and produce more cotton so that the Lowell mills and the mills around the world could be supplied with the cotton that they need. Another important idea that kind of came out during this period was the idea of interchangeable parts. So the idea that if you make something, it has the exact same part in every single item that you're producing, and that part can be removed and replaced. That's an interchangeable part. Uh, many of the things that we use today are this way, where you can take one piece out and put a new piece in. Uh, and this is how things were able to be produced instead of one at a time, each one done individually and is unique. Uh, they all have the exact same parts that you just produce the part in mass quantities and then you put it together if something breaks you take that piece out put another piece in Farming technology also grew during this period. One example is the mechanical reaper. A mechanical reaper is a device that helps you harvest at a much quicker rate. Uh, you can do the same amount with one person that it previously took you five people to do. Uh, you also had the steel plow invented by John Deere. This was really good for the western thicker soils that people were encountering in areas like Kentucky. Uh, because remember at this time, Kentucky and Tennessee and Ohio is the west. 
technology is also going to help with the communication revolution. Uh, most famously here is 1844. You have Samuel Morse. So Samuel Morse takes some wire. He strings it from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore, and he sends an electrical signal along that wire. And that is making it possible to send information long distances. He develops a system of dots and dashes known as Morse code that allows you to communicate a very long distance in a very short amount of time. So where it used to take you the time to actually take a letter and get on a horse and ride that distance, it now could be done almost instantaneously across a very, very long distance. So rather than having to ride 40 miles from Washington to Baltimore, you can just type out a message and it's there just within seconds. Uh, this is going to help make markets better because when you're growing things, you can let the market know how conditions are, what the expected crops are before they actually arrive at the market. And so that's going to help you plan and help you know what is coming. As I said at the beginning, the transportation revolution is going to be one of the most important uh, parts of this market revolution. You need a way to get people and material back and forth from where it's produced to the markets. And so this period is going to spark a debate in the country about what the government should or should not finance. Should the government pay for roads and other internal improvements? Or is this something that the federal government doesn't have the power to do? President Madison actually didn't believe that the Constitution allowed the federal government to create roads and use money on roads. He said that in order for them to do that is in order for his administration to do that, they would need a constitutional amendment. Uh, however, Congress thought that they did have the power to do that. So instead, they passed an internal improvement bill, which would provide the federal government money to build ro roads. Uh, on Madison's last day in office, he actually vetoed that resolution. Uh, so transportation networks are really, really important as Americans are moving west. So as I said, the west is Ohio and Kentucky and things like that. Ohio becomes a state in 1803. And so from very early on, they're going to use land sale money in Ohio to help pay for roads from the east into the west. So for example, a road from the Potomac River to the Ohio River. During this period, there's not many roads that go across the country. And the roads that are there are terrible conditions. It takes a long time to travel. Uh, and it's very, very dangerous, especially if you're going into areas like Kentucky and Ohio, where there are still tensions with Native Americans who are being pushed out of their lands by these new settlers. Uh, the very first turnpike that gets built is going to be from Philadelphia to Lancaster. It's not a very long distance, uh, but it's one of the first turnpikes. The turnpike is where you pay money to go on that road. So these would be built by private companies, and then you would use that private road if you pay your toll. With the terrible condition of roads, the real way to get around was rivers. If you are a farmer trying to get your product, your harvest from your farm to a market, a river is really going to be the best way for you to do that. The problem is that rivers can be kind of a one-way trip. Uh, you can't bring huge barges up and down the river at this point because there isn't a powered device to do that. Uh, but it is cheaper than trying to go overland. It is a bit safer but the problem is you have to be near a river so if you're not near a river it's not going to help you much uh, to have this idea that oh this is the cheapest way to do it and so you're going to see the production of a lot of canals being built during this period uh, the canal that is most famously known is the erie canal so the Erie Canal is going to be built in 1825, and it's going to connect the Great Lakes to New York City. Uh, it's going to go across upstate New York from Buffalo, uh, across into Rochester, Utica, Albany, and then it's going to hit the Hudson River, which goes straight down into New York City. And so this is going to make it a lot quicker for things to get from internal areas of New York to markets like New York City, but it's also going to make it quicker for people to get from places like Detroit in Michigan to New York City. So instead of having to go up the St. Lawrence River, you can cut across the Erie Canal. And so this is going to make it a lot faster. It's going to bring more products to market, and it's going to really improve a lot of things in that area. 
Another major improvement is going to be the steamboat. Uh, the very first steamboat was 1807. It was created by Robert Fulton. It was called the Claremont. And so this is going to make steam-powered ships. Uh, they're going to be able to go faster. They're going to be able to go against the river's path. So instead of just going down the river as the river flows, you're going to be able to go against that current. And it's going to provide fast and comfortable travel for passengers and goods. So the Claremont is able to go from New York City to Albany in 32 hours. Uh, it used to take four days for that journey to take place. In addition, there are the clipper ships that are introduced. This is a ship that's able to cross the Atlantic Ocean, and it's going to cut the travel time to England in about half. So it can take about 10 to 14 days instead of 20 to 28 days. So a journey that used to take almost a month can take only two weeks. While canals are going to be popular for a short period of time, the railroad is really what's going to change things. And once railroads are introduced, canals are going to really drop off quickly because they take a lot of time uh, and energy to be produced, whereas railroads can be constructed much quicker. So railroads begin in 1828. One of the very first ones is the Baltimore and Ohio, also known as the B and O. Uh, and by the time the Civil War breaks out about uh, 50 years later, 75% of railroads are going to be located in the north. They're going to connect farms to factories and markets. Uh, and like I said, they're much cheaper and quicker to build than canals. Uh, while there are railroads in the south, we're going to start seeing some differences between the north and the south where railroads become a much bigger part of the transportation landscape in the north than it is in the south. In the south, they're much shorter rail lines. Uh, they go from you know big areas to big areas. They aren't as interconnected as you'll see in the north. And as you can see, the transportation system grows quite a bit. So from the period right after the revolution where there aren't very many roads, uh, you can see roads are starting to be built, canals are being built, navigable waterways are being built. Uh, and so from 1825, a much smaller area is able to be reached. And then 35 years later, you can see a much larger area is going to be able to be re reached due to steam engines and canals and uh, things like that. And so the market revolution is going to result in a lot of changes in the country. It's going to change production. It's going to change how the workforce interacts with the markets. It's going to change society. It's going to change politics. And it's going to be a period where foreign relations changes uh, from the United States. In terms of production, things aren't going to be made one at a time anymore. They're going to be mass produced. They're going to create a whole bunch of things using interchangeable parts. Uh, people are going to go to work instead of working at home. So in the textile market, prior to the Industrial Revolution, fabric and cloth and textiles were made at home. They would give you the materials, you'd go home, you'd spin it and weave it, and you'd bring it in that way. Now this is going to be different. You now are going to go to a factory and you're going to work at that factory. Machines are going to produce things faster, it's going to produce it cheaper, and it's going to produce more than was able to be produced before. However, the downside to this is that when you work in a factory, the conditions are not going to be good. They're going to be dangerous, uh, and many people weren't happy with those conditions, and it's going to lead to changes later down the road. It's also going to change how people live. So instead of, as I said, working at home, they're going to be manufacturing these things in factories. And because of that, people are going to move to cities for jobs. They're going to leave their homes. They're going to leave the lives that they've known and that they've traditionally been doing for hundreds of years. And they're going to move into cities. Urbanization, especially in the north, is going to explode during this period. But it's also going to link regional economies together. So for example, like I said, cotton being produced in the south is going to be linked up with the mills in the north and the mills all the way across the ocean in England. And so this is going to make people more interconnected and more dependent on systems that they may not be doing, but they may be benefiting off of, specifically slavery. So while people in the north by this time are starting to eliminate slavery, they're still profiting and they're still using slave labor for their work to take place. Without the slaves in the South picking the cotton, the factories in the North and the factories in England wouldn't be able to produce the textiles to create the profit and the jobs and the urbanization that we're talking about here during this period. 
The market revolution period is also going to result in a lot of changes to society. Uh, the fact that people are leaving their homes to work, specifically women and children are leaving their homes, they're going outside of the home to earn wages, it's going to undermine the patriarchal family system that has been in place uh, for years and years and centuries and centuries before. It's going to change cities, and it's going to start shifting society into a more urban setting. And so when we talked about previously this idea between Jefferson and Hamilton about what the United States should be and how Jefferson believed that it should be an agrarian, a farming society, and Hamilton believed that it should be a manufacturing society, it's going to be turning toward this manufacturing idea that Hamilton had and away from that idea of small farms that Jefferson had. And so this is going to be a slow process over time, but eventually there will be more people in the United States living in cities than living in rural areas. And it's also going to lead to social reform movements because working conditions are bad. It's going to result in people pushing for better working conditions. It's going to be pushing for labor changes. It's going to be pushing for votes for women, for example, down the road. It's going to be pushing toward abolition. And so all these social changes are going to ta start taking place because of what is happening during this market revolution period. It's also going to see changes to the political systems in the United States. Uh, during this period, there's going to be increased immigration from other countries into the United States. And as a result, there's going to be a nativist response. People are going to start believing that immigrants threaten the future of native citizens, so people that were born in the United States. They're going to blame immigrants for the problems in society. They're going to say that they're the cause of crime and the cause of diseases. They're going to say that they're taking jobs from real Americans who were born here. Uh, and they're going to actually produce a party known as the Know Nothing Party. And so this Know Nothing Party is going to be for stricter citizenship laws. Uh, eventually, they're going to be called the American Party. Uh, but the reason they call them the Know Nothing is that oftentimes when they were asked about things about their party, they would say, well, I know nothing. Uh, government's also going to start passing protective tariffs. So in the past, we've talked about tariffs, and the idea was that they were designed for the government to make money because there wasn't a lot of taxing opportunities available when we're talking about the Articles of Confederation period. Uh, but during this period, we're going to have something called protective tariffs. And these are going to be things that are taxing outside foreign products as they come in to try and make American products more competitive. And so if you have a product that is made in the United States and you have the same type of product being made in a foreign country, those products would be taxed as they enter the United States, making them more expensive and then making the American product more likely to be purchased. And so these protective tariffs are going to be something that is really pushed by northern uh, manufacturing people. But it's also going to start illustrating the sectionalism that's going to be starting to be very evident. Uh, when we look at the tariff issue, people in the north where the factories are producing these things, they want the protective tariffs. Uh, but when we look at the south, these protective tariffs don't really do much for them. They don't have as many factories. They more produce raw materials. And so they don't see the benefit there to it. They're not having their products be more competitive. In fact, they're just seeing prices of things that they are buying go up. Uh, sectionalism is also going to show up in 1819 when the Missouri Territory wants to become a state. And many of the people who moved there were from Kentucky. They brought their slaves with them. And so this idea of would Missouri be admitted as a slave state or a free state is going to be one of the first big issues when we talk about this issue of slavery that's going to eventually push us down the road to the Civil War. And finally, there's going to be some issues with foreign relations that change during this period. Uh, as I mentioned previously, this is going on right after the War of 1812. And so there's this heightened feeling of national pride, of nationalism. And so this is going to change how the United States is dealing with foreign nations. Uh, for example, in 1817, the United States and Great Britain are going to come to an agreement on the Great Lakes. It's going to limit how many naval ships are allowed in the Great Lakes. Uh, and it's also going to see a year later, the United States and Great Britain setting a border of Canada between the two countries. The United States is also going to be a little more aggressive in their foreign policy, specifically when we look at the issue of Florida and Spain. Uh, and so 
in this period. The United States is going to take control of Western Spain. Uh, they're going to claim that that was part of the Louisiana Purchase. Spain is going to say, no, it wasn't, but they're really not going to do anything about it. And so the United States is going to take over Western Florida from the Spanish. They're also going to be looking at Eastern Florida. Uh, in this area, the Seminole Native American tribes are going to be raiding into American territory. The United States is going to use this as an excuse to invade Spanish Florida. Basically, they take over the capital of Spanish East Florida and they say, hey, Spain, if you can't control your territory, we're just going to stay here to make sure it is under control. And so basically, Spain gets the feeling that the United States is going to take Eastern Florida just like they took Western Florida. And so they decide that they're just going to get rid of Florida altogether, just get it to the United States. And so after this invasion of Eastern Florida, the adams onis Treaty takes place. In this treaty, Spain is going to give up all claims on Florida. It's going to give it all to the United States. It's also going to give up claims in the Oregon country. But the United States is going to agree that Spain is able to keep Texas, though this is eventually going to come into the United States in a few days decades. However, the most influential policy that starts during this period is the Monroe Doctrine, which was announced in 1823. Uh, the Monroe Doctrine says that the United States is going to stay out of European internal affairs. They're not going to get involved in their wars. They're just going to stay out of it. Uh, they're also not going to interfere with existing European colonies. So if the Europeans have a colony in the Americas right now, that's fine. But they're saying that in the future, there are not going to be any more European colonies in the Americas. Uh, in fact, it says henceforth, uh, the Americas will not be considered as subject for future colonization by any European power. And so this policy is really going to influence the United States foreign relations for years and years to come. Thank you for following along with the Market Revolution lecture notes. This was just a brief overview of what's going on during this period. It's a very complex uh, period that spans over uh, a number of years and a number of different presidencies and policies. Uh, but this is just a basic idea of how the economy was changing in the United States during this time.